Alan Moore. That's been a name of a creator that I've wanted to do for my YouTube show since the beginning, but I had to get a few episodes behind me to get the courage to talk about such an important figure. Because certainly, as far as respected creators in the field of comics go, Alan Moore is very, very high. I mean, maybe he's at the top. Uh, he's certainly among the very top creators that are very well respected. Um, he's a writer who's been working since, um, well, he got known very well in the early 80s, um, had a string of massively successful uh, hit comics throughout the mid-80s, throughout the whole 90s, and I mean, of course, he's still working today, creating some amazing, amazing material. So many great comics. A lot of people have heard of Watchmen, but there's V for Vendetta, there's From Hell, there's League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I just realized that I named a bunch of stuff that's been adapted as most of them not great movies. <laughs> and he's not too happy about that. He, he prefers the medium that he created these stories for. He, he prefers the, the stories to be, to be kept in, in that medium. Uh, and that's fine. He's entitled to his opinion. Um, I actually kind of like the Watchmen movie. It's okay. Uh, the others, yeah, I guess I guess they're, some of them are okay, but League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is just one of the worst things ever. That is a terrible movie. I mean, it's entertaining because it's so bad. It's the movie that got Sean Connery to just quit acting. I, I feel like I'm, I should hold that one against him. But I'm getting off topic. I want to talk about Alan Moore. And I feel like if there's one thing that he's known for as a good writer, if there's one thing within that sphere that he's really well known for, I think it's deconstruction. Specifically, I believe that he's an expert at taking existing stories and existing characters, finding ways to break them down to their core elements and place them in a different context. Usually it's taking superheroes and putting them in a more real-world context and seeing what those implications might be. That's something that he does a fair amount in a lot of his works. But he's got some other tropes too. What I wanted to do today was review an issue of Miracle Man. Now that was a comic in the 80s that was published in, the, in England, in the UK, and it was some of his earlier work that was very popular. I wanted to take a look at how many tropes are in there, and because he's known for deconstruction, I thought that every time I saw a trope, I would deconstruct something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat a knife up to a thousand degrees and cut my way through some toys. I'm going to do that as my deconstruction every time we hit a trope. So, we're going to read Miracle Man, but first, let me list for you some of the tropes that you could reasonably expect to find in any given Alan Moore comic book. They include magic as a powerful force of expression, anarchy as a positive force, Reinvention of existing characters. Taking drugs or hallucinating. Deconstruction, specifically looking at how superheroes may affect the real world. Ordinary people having just as much power to affect change as superheroes. Extensively detailed backstories or important flashbacks. Match cut transitions. Experimenting with story structure form. So this is The Dreaming, a great local comic book store here in Seattle, uh, in the University District. Um, definitely caters to, to people like, it's got a lot of gaming stuff, but it's uh, got a really wide selection of comics and it's got a really good selection of trade paperbacks. I'm going to look here and I'm pretty sure they'll have um, uh, one of Marvel's new uh, reprints of Alan Moore's Miracle Man. Before we look at the issue that we're going to review, which will be Miracle Man number three, um, I wanted to just give a little bit of a background in case you're not fully aware of what Miracle Man is. Basically, uh, back in the, um, I want to say 50s, early 50s, uh, the UK had a publisher that was reprinting uh, Shazam, Captain Marvel, I should say. And uh, eventually they lost the rights to reprint those DC comics. And, or maybe it was even Fawcett comics. You know, don't, don't hold me. I'm not giving a perfect account of this. There's an important element that I want to get to. But basically, they were doing Captain Marvel. And they lost the rights to do those reprints. So they basically decided to create their own analog. A very similar character that they called Marvel Man instead of Captain Marvel. 
And uh, later, in the 80s, this printer decided to revisit those comics, which hadn't been published since the 60s, and called it Miracle Man uh, when they were printed here in America because they wanted to avoid a lawsuit with Marvel Comics. They, they didn't want to call it Marvel Man because they just felt that that was just too risky. For, for the reprints of Marvel Man in America, they called it Miracle Man. I hope that that's clear. Anyway, what it's really about, um, it was very much, like I say, an analog for Captain Marvel. In other words, there was a character who could say a magic word and he became transformed into a powerful superhero and he had sidekicks like Young Miracle Man, Kid Miracle Man, I think there was Miracle Woman. So they, he had a roster of um, people that were imbued with the same powers. Now the main character in Miracle Man, his name is Mike Moran. He's a journalist, a, a lot like you know the character in Captain Marvel. Um, but when Alan Moore decided to take it up, he did not throw away all those stories from the past. He said, no, that's canon. And that's, by the way, sort of another trope. Um, he has never sort of said the stuff that happened before didn't happen. He'll reinvent it and come up with a new angle. But he still says, yeah, that stuff all happened. For instance, if you read his Swamp Thing run, um, it never discounts anything that happened before. So... Uh, we've got Miracle Man here, Mike Moran, it's picking up more or less 20 years later. And now Mike Moran, in this comic that we're going to review, is a 40-something, somewhat schlubby reporter. Pretty happily married, though. He's got a wife, Liz, and he has been having dreams, or almost nightmares, of being this really powerful superhero. But, but it seems to him like dreams. He can't remember that he actually was Miracle Man until like the first couple of issues and he remembers that he can transform himself into Miracle Man. And one of the first things he does is he, find, is he looks up um, his old sidekick, Kid Miracle Man. He finds him running a business and then there's a twist in issue two where we realize that, the, that it isn't the grown-up uh, kid that he knew. It's actually the sort of superhero that he transforms into who was always, like, sort of older. And he's been living as that character for 18 years. And he's kind of evil. So that's where we're going to pick up right here in Issue 3. Let's get to it. Issue 2 ended with Kid Miracle Man beating the crap out of Mike Moran, leaving him for dead. Now his wife, Liz, is in a car racing away, trying to escape. And Kid Miracle Man shows up in front of her car, just stands there, smashes it, and he taunts her. He's about to crush her, saying that she's going to die just like her husband did. And then suddenly, uh, Mike Moran has survived just enough to call himself Miracle Man. His magical word is Komoda, which is atomic backwards, if you pay attention. <laughs> Miracle Man and Kid Miracle Man begin having a knock-down, drag-out battle, a battle of titans. There's a lot of interesting uh, dialogue, a lot of interesting uh, captions describing the events. I'm not going to repeat it all. Uh, it's totally worth a read. It's really exciting stuff. As they're having this fight, we come across one of the tropes of Alan Moore, and I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, two things happen. Uh, one, some police see what's happening, and they're like, yeah, we're not gonna <laughs> try to get involved there because that will get killed. Like, look at how powerful these, essentially, gods are. Uh, second thing, though, is it is reported. I mean, how could this stuff be ignored? The government finds out about it, and we see a government agent who knows about Miracle Man. He knows whatever happened to make Mike Moran forget that he was Miracle Man, he knows about it. And he's making some calls to um, various sort of covert operatives. They, they, they sort of have a plan to handle this if it ever happens. Um, and I think that that's a very real world take on, on the material. I think that's our first trope. I think that's a bit of deconstruction. I think um, essentially all of these issues are a great example from cover to cover of deconstruction. But, so that's one small example within the larger context.
Here's the results of that emoji ball. Uh, yeah, just cut right through it like butter. It just, the knife just went right through it. Um, I didn't have to exert any pressure. And then I held the flat end to it just to sort of melt it. Oh my God. So this thing does not hold up to heat very well. It didn't catch on fire, but uh, it was destroyed pretty easily. Because Mike Moran hasn't been Miracle Man for a very long time, he's not in practice. And Kid Miracle Man, meanwhile, has been this powerful entity for 18 years. And Kid Miracle Man basically just mops the floor with him. But he makes one fatal mistake. He starts to gloat. He specifically says, and now I'm going to finish him off. His adoring junior protege, me, Kid Miracle Man. It trails off like that because he realizes that when he says Miracle Man, that's his word. And he hasn't had to say that for 18 years, so he just didn't think. He hasn't been thinking about it. And he's transformed back into like a 13-year-old boy. A timid 13-year-old boy that has a completely different personality from Kid Miracle Man. It makes this interesting argument that's expanded on throughout the coming issues that Alan Moore wrote, where he basically says, this person isn't transformed into a superhero so much as he literally swaps places with another being. They, they have access to each other's memories. So in short bursts, when he would transform into Miracle Man for, you know, an hour or something, he thought that that was still himself. But really, he was swapping places, and they just share memories. And it brings up a lot of interesting and kind of creepy uh, ideas that are associated with that, that these are two separate beings. I mean, because he's got a wife, and, you know, Miracle Man is perfect, Mike Moran is not perfect. That relationship really gets tested in the coming issues. Kid Miracle Man is now transformed into Jonathan Bates, and... He's a good kid, and he's like, don't kill me, don't kill me, that wasn't me. And he gets put into a mental hospital for boys. Um, and the whole rest of Alan Moore's run, which is like about a year and a half, uh, this kid was nearly catatonic, and in his mind, he was constantly taunted by Kid Miracle Man to let him out. And he was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to. And you're just scared because anytime something bad happens and some bad things happen to Jonathan Bates, he's always tempted to simply say, Kid Miracle Man. And that would be his escape from a bad situation. Anyway, it's a big scary threat because we see, like, right from his first appearance, he just wipes Miracle Man across the floor. He is very, very powerful. He's grown up, essentially. And, uh, yeah, so that's a pretty cool scary idea. The next page of the story features another trope that Alan Moore is known for, and that is the match cut transition between panels. Specifically, we're looking at a British intelligence officer back in the 60s, and then cutting to him as he is today. It shows the time that has passed and, and the burden that he carries knowing about what happened to Miracle Man and that they need to handle it again. Match cut transitions. One interesting thing to quickly note is that Alan Moore doesn't care for the film adaptations of his work. And that's fine. Uh, he doesn't always outright hate them, like he's sometimes rumored to, but he doesn't really care for them. He likes them to be presented in their original um, medium, comic books. That's what they were, these stories were designed for. He doesn't think they necessarily work as movies. And he could be right. Certainly none of the adaptations have been perfect. So he could be right. But he still uses... A lot of film techniques, in my opinion. Um, his comics can be very cinematic in times, and certainly the match cut transition is a, is a good example of that. Now, I think that's fair because comics and film are both visual mediums. I just thought that was maybe an interesting sort of contrast, that he doesn't necessarily like film and TV too much, but he does still use some of their techniques.
there are the remains of uh, this sort of knockoff G.I. Joe action figure. Uh, again, I didn't have to give any pressure to cut through this guy. It just cut right through. Just no resistance at all. So I deconstructed this useless guy. <laughs> Supposedly, these things that I've destroyed are recyclable plastics, so they're going into a special stream to be recycled. I hope that that's true. The next page of this comic, issue three, uh, it's, it's starting sort of a new story, and just to explain what that is, these were originally printed uh, as seven and eight page installments in a weekly comic book in the UK. They were black and white, and I actually have um, those issues. They're great. The ones I'm showing are from a reprint by Marvel Comics, who eventually got the rights. Uh, and they just started printing that like a year ago. The legal story behind it could take half an hour to explain, and I'm not exaggerating. It's quite long and intricate as to who holds the rights to this character, Miracle Man. We're not going to get into that right now. It's just too long. But um, So I'm showing you uh, some images from the reprints, but the original issues... Uh, for a long time were, were just eight issue weekly um, stories and then they would grab like three of those and print, reprint them uh, in America in the um, mid 80s, a few years later. Uh, Eclipse Comics actually published those. A few days have passed. Mike Moran and his wife Liz are trying to figure out exactly what Miracle Man's powers are. And in this case, Liz is really, I think, an equal partner to Mike. She doesn't have superpowers, but she's come prepared. She's figured out all these tests that they can do to figure out the extent of his powers. She bought a bunch of comic books to try to learn what can superheroes do? Can you do that? And she's also his emotional rock. She is there for him. She knows that Mike is a flawed person. She loves him because he is who he is. Um, it's pretty amazing. And I think that that's a good example of another trope Ordinary people having just as much power as the superheroes uh, and amazing creatures in a lot of his stories. I think that one thing that's fantastic about that is that it shows a contrast and it, and it shows how amazing a character's feats can be when you contrast that against somebody else that does not have powers. But that doesn't mean that they're ineffectual. Um, certainly in the Swamp Thing run, I thought that uh, Abby, Swamp Thing's girlfriend, I think we could say, was a very well-rounded, uh, grounded character in her own right. Um, I think that if you look at V for Vendetta, Evie is an ordinary woman who becomes V's protege. V had stuff done to him. He was experimented on in some way. Um, but Evie is ordinary. Um, but she's... She's his chosen successor, in a, in a sense. I did a bad job on this video because I forgot to record the very beginning, but, um, yeah, it, it, like, oh, this, this face just creeps me out, actually, what I did to this. Hold on. I mean, that thing just fell right apart, too. Um, this idea ended up creeping me out more than I meant it to, uh, just a little too much, like, I don't know. It's, it's a person. I wish I'd only gotten, like, vehicles and balls and stuff to cut through, not, not like a doll. I didn't really mean for it to be creepy. I was just curious how, how much pressure I'd have to use to, to destroy this thing. And uh, the answer is not much. It, it wasn't too strong. I mean, it all fell apart very, very easily. Uh, but it was also a little creepier than I meant for it to be. Sorry about that. While Mike and Liz are figuring out the extent of Miracle Man's powers, 
we check in on Jonathan Bates and we see what's going on in his mind where he's just being taunted by Kid Miracle Man to let him out. And we know the destructive power that that could bring. So that's pretty scary. The next pages of the story uh, cut back and forth between Mike and Liz figuring out his powers and, and kind of who he is and how that maybe affects their relationship. Uh, and also this government operative known as Evelyn Cream, a guy with sapphires for teeth. I mean, uh, he looks like a James Bond villain. Going to the hospital and talking to people that uh, Miracle Man has already fought. He's trying to track down who Miracle Man is um, because some of these people saw Mike Moran change into Miracle Man. And it's interesting because Evelyn Cream seems at first to be a villain. He kills this guy that he interviews uh, in the hospital, who's sort of a dirty uh, British agent, so we shouldn't feel too, too bad about it. But still, we see that he's a killer, and that he's somehow tasked by the British government with tracking down this amazingly powerful superhero. But over the run of the story, we sort of get to know him a little better, and he's a very complex, character that is not necessarily inherently evil. He has a very unique point of view, but he's not an evil man. He ends up sort of befriending the Morans, in a sense. Uh, it's, it's an interesting arc. I won't describe the whole thing for you. It's definitely recommended reading. Miracle Man is a great story. Uh, just keep in mind that, you know, Alan Moore wrote it for a year and a half, then he passed it off to Neil Gaiman, um, essentially, it doesn't get fully resolved. It didn't get wrapped up because eventually the, the publisher folded. So it doesn't necessarily have a satisfying conclusion, although now that Marvel owns the rights to it, it may end up retroactively being given some more issues to, to come to more of a conclusion or continue as a serialized story, perhaps. The Alan Moore run is still, in and of its own right, fascinating examination of superheroes in the real world that happened well before he ever did uh, Swamp Thing uh, or um, Superman and Batman he wrote issues for. Uh, it's well before Watchmen, years before Watchmen. So this was his first examination of superheroes in the real world. The next eight pages or so, I'm not going to go into extreme detail, but a big part of what the story is, is that Mike and Liz are talking about, you know, when he's Miracle Man, is he still Mike? Mike says that while he's got those memories, that Miracle Man thinks differently. He can tell that he thinks differently when he's Miracle Man, that his emotions are purer and stronger. They're, they're almost inconceivable to humans. So he's feeling very sort of insecure because he can turn into this amazing being and he's not quite sure if that's him. Anyway, as we wrap up this story, that's one more trope. Reinvention. Not the same necessarily as deconstruction. Deconstruction is breaking these elements down and examining them in a real world setting. Reinvention is because the original stories were simply pulpy adventure superhero stories. And he's found this additional layer Alan Moore has found this additional layer where he's asking, is Miracle Man Mike Moran or is he another being? Um, and he really takes a close look at where the powers came from and uh, things like that that are completely different. You know, he, he's, he's found a completely new way of looking at things. It's not quite a retcon. He hasn't gone back and said none of that stuff happened, but he's reinvented it.
Oh my lord. This thing did not survive. Look at this. It caught on fire, obviously. You've seen that. I didn't expect that. It just melted all together. There's hardly any of the yellow car. It's just gears. It's just a few metal and plastic gears in there. Wow. This thing uh, caught fire pretty easily, in my opinion. I think uh, this toy is a little more dangerous than I would have expected. I'd warn you to stay away from it, but you can only really find it at a dollar store, and I wonder who even buys this stuff, aside from people like me that are destroying it. It's me. The issue ends with Evelyn having tracked down Mike Moran at his business. Mike is actually holding a baby in an elevator. He's about to go downstairs, and Evelyn comes up and shoots him, and we see things from Mike's perspective as everything fades to black. Talk about a really cool cliffhanger. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I definitely recommend picking this story up if you haven't already read it, uh, because it goes in some fascinating directions. Alan Moore is incredible. I've never been disappointed by anything of his that I've read. Some of it I like more than others, but I've always enjoyed everything by him that I've read. I think, um, I think my favorite might be V for Vendetta. I think that, that holds up to a large extent. Um, I also adore his Superman story, what do you get for the man who has everything? Which was actually the final Superman story told before DC rebooted everything uh, back in like, uh, what, 85, 86 with Crisis on Infinite Earths. So it was the last Superman story set um, in that time period. And that story has been adapted in the um, animated Superman show, um, or maybe it was Justice League, but you know, one of those animated shows and it was adapted into a Supergirl episode um, it's a really fascinating one. That's a really good quick story, and I love his Swamp Thing run. But you know what? I could keep listing great Alan Moore comics because everything he's written has been pretty great. I'd definitely be curious to hear, you know, what your favorite Alan Moore comics are and whether you've read Miracle Man, what you think of Miracle Man, because it's some of his earlier work. I think it holds up tremendously well. I don't think it feels very dated at all, and he benefits from having some really great artists. Gary Leach, Alan Davis. Um, you know, I think that he, Chuck Austin drew some of the issues now that I think of it. Chuck Austin uh, sort of became known as a really bad writer on the X-Men comics, but he got his start as an artist. Um, I think he was a Lucasfilm special effects guy that became a comic book artist, and then like in the late 90s or early 2000s, he was writing comics. Um, but his artwork wasn't too bad. It was, it, was, it was good in Miracle Man. Anyway, I could ramble on forever. I love Alan Moore. Um, definitely curious what some of your opinions are, so leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next week, keep reading comics.